This is RTV6 News at 6, working for you. It's a legal standoff. Why the Madison County prosecutor is putting the Edgewood Town Court out of business for now. I'm Rafael Sanchez. That story coming up on the News at 6. A Kokomo woman says officers sexually assaulted her while she was in jail. The action now underway to make changes. If I would have been in the street like those ladies, I mean, how can you defend yourself? You don't expect something like that happening. A violent assault on the cultural trail. One woman shares her story of coming face to face with the suspect just one day prior. And another big change for the Indianapolis 500 because of the pandemic, and it could impact you. What well, you need to know tonight. Welcome into the News at 6. I'm Amanda Starantino. And I'm Mark Mullins. A prosecutor is taking a tough stance after he says one of his employees was the target of the N-word. What's more, the person accused of using that racist slur is a court bailiff. The court is pushing back, calling on state police to step in. Call 6 Chief Investigator Rafael Sanchez has this developing story discovered first by RTV6. The town of Edgewood Court is facing an uncertain future. The Madison County prosecutor is pulling all of its cases after a court employee allegedly used the N-word in referring to Deputy Prosecutor Rosemary Corey, who is black. It's just simply not acceptable to harbor those feelings and then expect justice is going to be dispensed fairly to everyone. It's just, it cannot happen. It just cannot happen. Corey did not hear the alleged racial slur, but a co-worker who is white did on two occasions and reported it. Town Court Judge Scott Norick says his employee, now on paid leave, denies the allegation. And he hopes that a state police investigation will get to the bottom of this. To suppose that I'm not going to provide fair treatment to anyone and I'm the only one that makes court decisions about whether someone's innocent or guilty, uh, that is uh, very concerning and, and I, I can't think of any other way other than to try to harm my character. It doesn't matter to me who it is. If I see things that aren't right, I'm going to say what I'm going to, I'm going to do what I think is right. I'm going to speak out. Even in these troubled times that we face today, it is not unreasonable or appropriate to fire someone uh, by a mere allegation. Judge Norick says he reached out to Corey, who tells RTV6, I was shocked and hurt by the racial slur, but heartened that my coworker spoke up. This shows great courage on her part because she didn't have to. She could have kept quiet. I applaud her. The Madison County prosecutor tells me that he's not changing his position. He says that come Monday, court cases will be heard throughout Madison County, everywhere but the Edgewood Town Court. Working for you in Edgewood in Madison County, Rafael Sanchez, RTV6. Judge Norick says Edgewood Court handles about 5,000 cases a year. As for Rosemary Corey, her name may sound familiar because she's the special prosecutor handling the Dre John Reed shooting death involving IMPD. You don't have to go outside of your neighborhood to find people who are attempting to change. Next Thursday, RTV6, along with our partners at Radio 1, will air a virtual town hall called A Conversation on Race, connecting Central Indiana. Our Nicole Griffin is talking with some of the speakers with what they hope people take away from the conversation. Conversations about race can be difficult and uncomfortable, but leaders that I'm hearing from that are taking part in the virtual town hall say these conversations are necessary so that we can all be part of the change. I think it's so important that we are comfortable having difficult conversations with our youth, with our kids, our children about what's happening in our community. Maggie A. Lewis is one of several panelists taking part in the virtual town hall. She's a mother of a teenage son and the CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Indianapolis. Lewis is part of a segment that will focus on what many families call the talk. Families are talking about being black in America. What does that mean? Um, also talking about choices, making sure that you understand that if you're pulled over by an officer, what that conversation should look like, what you should be saying, what you should be doing. If you live in Hamilton County, if you live in Marion County, if you're in 46260 or 46218 or 46222, there's a way that you have to act. And we really feel that's very important for the uh, the sustainability of our children to move on to to grow 
to go on to high school, to go on to college and become productive citizens. The conversation will focus on the past, present, and how to move forward. Leaders taking part hope people will tune in and take away messages they can share with their own friends and family so we can all be part of the change. Working for you, Nicole Griffin, RTV6. And you can watch a conversation on race connecting Central Indiana Thursday, July 2nd from 7 until 8 p.m. right here on RTV6 and on our digital platforms. It will also be simulcast on three Radio 1 stations. A Kokomo, a Kokomo woman is coming forward after she says she was sexually assaulted by a corrections officers at the Howard County Jail. She's taking legal action and hopes her case will prompt changes at the facility. Call 6 Investigates Kara Kenny went through the complaint and explains why she's speaking out. We want to warn you, some people may find the details disturbing. In February, Shayna Turner was serving time at the Howard County Jail on charges related to theft and escape. She says she was sexually assaulted on two occasions by two different corrections officers. Shayna says one made her touch his private area and the other... Took me into the changing room, which is basically where you change out your uniforms at up front. And me being a female, I am only allowed to be in there with another female officer. Well, he took me in there to change over my outfit and uh, grabbed my uh, vagina and shoved his tongue down my throat. Shayna says she was in shock. I mean, I don't think that's right. I mean, we're all human. Some people make mistakes, some people don't. We're just like anybody else. We just chose to make that mistake. Doesn't mean that we don't have the same rights as somebody that's not in jail. Shana and her attorney, Tim Stays, have filed a tort claim against the Howard County Sheriff's Office and jail, putting them on notice of their intent to sue for negligence. Obviously, we want to see the truth told. Uh, sunlight's the best disinfectant. I think we all want to have good, honorable law enforcement officers, and sometimes we have to take actions to pick out ones that aren't and deal with them. Shayna reported the allegations to the sheriff's office. Shortly after, in early March, the sheriff announced six employees were terminated at the jail following an internal investigation into allegations of improper activity with inmates that violated department policies. Two incidents were referred to the prosecutor's office for possible criminal charges. Shayna's attorney says at least one of the officers who touched Shayna was among the six fired. Once the lawsuit starts, I'll be able to find out everything. We reached out to Sheriff Jerry Asher about Shana's claims. He told us no comment. In March, Asher said all staff would receive extensive training on policies, including relations with inmates. Shana says she's speaking out and taking action because she hopes the jail will do more to keep inmates safe and because she knows other inmates are afraid no one will believe them. Probably a lot of people don't say anything about it, and I'm just not that type of person. I feel like they need to be punished for what they did. They're not above the law, and they're not above anybody else. Care Kenny, RTV6. The Howard County prosecutor told us this afternoon he reviewed information provided by the sheriff's office and found there was insufficient evidence to file charges against correctional officers. Prosecutor Mark McCann says there was no independent evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the crime occurred. Another big change announced for the Indianapolis 500. Today, Indianapolis Motor Speedway President Doug Bowles said they will be limiting attendance to about 50% of IMS's capacity because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The plan is to realign seating to allow for more space between people on race day. The track will also provide masks and sanitizer. Bowles says anyone 65 and older or anyone with an underlying heart condition should consider staying home. The Indianapolis 500 is still set to happen on Sunday, August 23rd. Is it August yet? <laughs> it feels like it, that's for sure. Here's a question I think I know the answer to. Do you feel the humidity? Quite a change from yesterday. You combine that with a 92 degree temperature in Lafayette, you get the idea of where we're headed. The two stars of the weekend, humidity with periods of thunderstorms through central Indiana. It won't be all day rains. When it rains, though, it will pour as a result of that humidity. The severe threat is in northern portions of Illinois. That will slide to the east along the 
the state line with Michigan and Indiana. So the best chance for any severe weather stays to our north through the evening hours. We're dry in central Indiana right now and we're warm. It feels like 91 in Indy. 93 is the heat index in Lafayette. There's that slight risk for strong storms in the northern portion of the state. More on that when I come back and details about your weekend. An Indianapolis man is facing multiple charges accused of attacking several women in downtown Indianapolis. The Marion County Prosecutor's Office has formally charged Victor Johnson with attempted murder, attempted rape, battery, and intimidation, among other things. Our policy at RTV6 is to conceal the identity of victims involved in sexual assault cases. But tonight, you'll hear from one of the first women involved in the case. She her shared her story with RTV6's Megan Sanctorum. It was just very fast, very, very fast. It's a scene that keeps playing over and over in this Indianapolis woman's head. She tells us she was in this parking lot near Alabama and New York when a man approached her and asked for a hug. She says he was holding a knife, so she tried to get back in her car, but he wouldn't let her close the door. She says she kicked and yelled until others nearby came to help and chased the man away. Then when people came, I said, oh my God, somebody's here, he's not gonna, you know, I'm safe now. She was safe, but others wouldn't be. According to court documents, the man is accused of doing something similar to another woman earlier that day. Then the next day, he's accused of attacking several women in this park by the War Memorial and then stabbing and trying to rape a woman on the cultural trail near Illinois. Bystanders were able to chase him and hold him until police arrived. I really feel bad that the day after, you know, he was still around and unable uh, to do what he did. She says she will not let this stop her from enjoying time downtown. She plans to take self-defense classes in the future. Working for you, Megan Sanctorum, RTV6. Police are asking anyone else who may have come in contact with Victor Johnson last week to contact them to protect yourself. Police do recommend sticking to well-lit areas. They say if you feel like someone is following you, go to a well-populated area and call 911. We continue to track new developments with the COVID-19 pandemic in Indiana. And today, the State Department of Health reports 510 new COVID-19 cases. That is 13 fewer new cases than were reported yesterday. 44,140 people in Indiana have been diagnosed with the coronavirus since the pandemic began more than three months ago. Today, the Department of Health confirms nine new COVID-19 deaths, which is the same as yesterday and the day before that. So far, 2,400 and three Hoosiers have died from the coronavirus. The state says more than 453,800 people have been tested for the virus. 9.7% of them tested positive for COVID-19. Experts say COVID-19 is revealing what they say is systemic racism and inequities in education. We introduce you to one person trying to bring about change for students across the state with the hope of helping more people complete college. And I'm Dave First. Beautiful afternoon in Meridian Hills. Who's ready for a round of golf? Maybe a hole in one or eight. That story coming up in our Sports Extra Spotlight. You can find new roads with confidence. We know COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting black and brown communities. Experts say the same is true with systemic racism and inequities in education. RTV6's Stephanie Wade speaks with someone working to change that for Hoosier students and families across the state. This is a chrysalis moment, the moment we've been waiting for. The moment when Dr. Yolanda Watson Spiva with Complete College America says we can no longer ignore inequities and disparities among college and high school students but instead are forced to address them. What I'm hearing from presidents is that they're realizing they had a lot of blind spots. Like they had no idea, even though we've heard things about like a black student sleeping in their, the common area in their dorm and somebody telling them they don't belong there. CCA pushes for change in higher education that allows more students to complete college. They work with lawmakers and universities to institute policy changes. You know, we've always looked to them for guidance around policy, around practice. IUPUI, Purdue University, the Indiana Commission for Higher Education are some of the partners to name a few. Thinking about what are the barriers that we have structurally embedded in our systems that are impeding students from, from completing college. COVID-19 revealing many of those. 
if you do not have a laptop or some sort of techno technology to load into, people are having to really do all of their homework and research on a phone. The lack of technological capabilities, Wi-Fi inequity being one. Most institutions, I don't want to say they were reticent to do online learning. Much of it was one, resources, right? It takes a lot of money to either equip students with laptops or Wi-Fi or technology, but also to train and skill up. We have a lot of um, faculty members and administrators. And recognizing things will look much different come fall, factoring in social distancing, health and safety procedures. I was on a call with the CDC about how institutions will be able to reopen. And I'll tell you, to be honest with you, at the end of that long call, I was like, I don't know if institutions are going to be able to do this. Not to mention how current events have prompted people to speak out. Some institutions are doing um, surveys to their students. Some are also talking to alumni. Dr. Watson Spiva saying the interconnectedness created through the virus has made us see our interconnectedness in humanity. Students are finding their voices. Faculty of color are also speaking up in ways that they haven't in the past. So it's going to be an interesting confluence between COVID-19 and this sort of just new conversation. Stephanie Wade, RTV6. We are dry on this Friday evening. Now this may look overwhelming, intimidating as far as our rain chances as we go through the next four or five days. Now remember, we're going to have dry hours. All that's saying is seven times out of 10. With the weather system moving through tomorrow, you'll have rain at your house. Doesn't mean you're gonna have all day rain. I think we'll have dry stretches. We will not get a break from the humidity, whether that's at the daytime, nighttime, or next several days, even through Thursday of next week, a more tropical feel. We get the idea of what it's going to be like today. You notice that change in the humidity already. Where temperatures hit 90 today, they're less likely to do that tomorrow because of periods of thunderstorms and more cloud cover. 84, the magic number in Indy, 85 on the Sunday. Well, we followed the dust plume from Africa across the Atlantic down into the Gulf Coast now. All indications are from our forecast model. Main impact of this is going to stay south of the Ohio River as we go through the day tomorrow. Any haze in the sky would help create a more vivid uh, sunrise or sunrise set as a result of some of that dust. Well, the flag's whipping in the wind. We've had strong southwest wind. We'll continue to have winds gust over 20 miles per hour through the night tonight and through the weekend, ensuring the flow of moist and warm air. We're not uh, expecting any thunderstorms here in the short term. By 11 o'clock, there they are, northwest Indiana, pushing south and east. Now that's not a favorable time for strong storms. They kind of lose some steam, but there's still a potential that isolated severe storm with damaging wind being the main threat as those drift from north to south into tomorrow morning. More of the same tomorrow. Wind and hail would be the main threats, but the overall threat is what we call marginal or low for all of central Indiana. Thunderstorms possible just about any time in this heat and humidity. Temperature of 84. Uh, timing of thunderstorms tomorrow, 1 o'clock to 4, you see the expansion of thunderstorms right through the heart of central Indiana, any one of which would have torrential downpours of rain. More thunderstorms around Sunday, Monday, even thunderstorms on Tuesday, consistently in the upper 80s next week with lows around 70. There's a bizarre trend on the city's north side, one every golf player hopes will continue. It's Aces Wild Sports Director Dave First with the Sports Extra Spotlight. Meridian Hills Country Club has been around for nearly 100 years. And during that time, it's never seen anything like this. It all started with Brian Acton the day after the club reopened. A hole in one on the part 3 12th. Then it was David Draga on the same hole a few days later. And then three weeks later, over on the two-way radio. You know, I'm giving a lesson and all I catch is, you know, hole in one. So I sort of back off my lesson. I sort of whisper into the room. I'm like, did we just have another one? Sure enough, it was Dr. Don Shelburd on the par 315, the nine iron from 119 yards out. The rest is almost literally like clockwork. Two days later, 88-year-old Dr. Jack Williams got his first ace on the par 3 7th. And the next day, it was Dr. Tom Leipzig back on the 12th. And then another two days later on the 7th from Tom Rush. It makes you wonder, what's in the wind at Meridian Hills? You know, I will say this. You know, with being closed in that month of April, 
I know our grounds crew, and I mean this sincerely, they were able to do a lot of things on the golf course that they probably could not do if we would have stayed open. And right now the golf course is in the best stinking shape I've ever seen. Scott Kaysen would agree on June 14th, he aced the seventh with a nine iron. And most recently, Greg Sheridan with a hole in one back on the 12th. That green is the one of the green that if you hit to the left of the green, everything sort of kicks the route. So we call it the membership bounce. <laughs> so hit to the left, got lucky. Make it eight hole in ones in eight weeks. They all get their name added to the club plaque, a season ending dinner, and more importantly, scholarships to many of the college kids who work at the course. Still, though, eight and eight weeks? Some of the pros that follow me on social media, they think we're still using those coffee cup size <laughs> holes. Some of That's them right. think we have three, three holes per par three. Uh -huh. It's about perfection. Perfect greens, perfect conditions, capped by a perfect shot. And as you might imagine, the amount of play here at Meridian Hills has picked up over the last couple of weeks, last couple of months, really. In fact, they're doing almost double the activity they usually do this time of year, which can make finding a tea time. Oh, yeah, tea time. Uh, can I get one for next week? Almost as difficult as the hole-in-ones themselves. Two o'clock's perfect. Day first, RTV6 Sports. Yeah, a uh, foursome. Yeah. GX, now with great offers at your Buick dealer. Thunderstorms stay well north until after midnight. Then they'll be dropping more to the south into central Indiana during the overnight. An update coming up at 7 o'clock. World News.